Welcome to Liberate University. All right, it's seven o'clock. Hi. Hi at home. There's, it's a hybrid session, so if you see me like looking off out of the frame, then that's what I'm talking to. Hi, everyone at home. So my name is Jeroen de Witt. I'm going to be your past life tour guide for the evening. Um, it's a hybrid class, so there's people at home and people here, obviously. Um, so um, let's see. There's going to be some people coming in. They're just coming late, but they'll just file in and just lay down, get comfortable. Um, let me go over the technical details on how to have the best session tonight. So you want to be comfortable, and this goes for you at home as well, you want to be comfortable but not lay down. It's very tempting to lay down during this process, but um, I'm very talented at talking people to sleep. So if you don't want to, <laughs> if you don't want to end up having a fifteen to twenty dollar um, nap, then you know I suggest that you just kind of sit up with your back supported. You can slouch, but yeah, laying down more often than not results in people just passing out completely because of my wonderful voice. <laughs> um, so. Your past life regression tonight. I'm going to be introducing this work for a little bit and feel free to ask questions and you at home as well. I can follow you here in the chat box. So if you have a question um, or you want to share something, then just type it in the chat box and I'll see if I can get through it. I'll do my best. Um, so my name is Jeroen de Witt, just to explain where my name is from because it sounds so weird in, in the United States. I live just around the corner, but I am from the Netherlands, and it's a very common name in the Netherlands. Um, although it sounds really weird, we do very weird names in the Netherlands compared to, you know, English names. Um, and it's a Dutch version of Jerome. So um, I came here in 2007, and I was trained by Dolores Cannon back in 2006 to do this work. And this is how long I've been merrily regressing people into different lifetimes with a lot of fun. Um, is, is that name familiar to you guys? Dolores Cannon? Yes. Some yes? Okay, yeah. So Dolores Cannon was one of the four pioneers into the work of past life regression. There was Dr. Brian Weiss who wrote the book, Many Lives, Many Masters. And then there was Michael Newton who developed life in between life regressions. And then there was Paul Thomas. I'm not quite sure what angle he had on the work. Um, so I just want to give a little bit of history to this work. Dolores Cannon started back in the 1960s and 70s with her then husband. Um, she was kind of bored. Her husband was in the Navy, and so she decided that she was going to take an hypnosis class to help people um, lose weight and stop smoking. And so in the beginning, they did this together. By accident, regressed somebody into a different lifetime. And have you ever seen a picture of her? Yeah. So I always thought it was so funny. Like when I took her class, I'm looking at this like, little white Midwestern church lady, you know, she looked like a church lady with a little perm. And, you know, when she opened her mouth, all this galactic and, you know, a super expanded stuff would just roll out of her mouth. I thought the contrast was really funny, but that was the area she was from. She was um, from Arkansas, from the Bible Belt, from a Christian background. So I give this lady a lot of credit that back in the 1960s and 70s, she was able to not like freak out by having regressed somebody into a different lifetime but instead just got really curious about what the hell's happening because there was no Google, no YouTube at the time. So she was basically like staring blind. She didn't know what was going on. And um, instead of like closing the book and saying, oh, it's Satan, I'm never gonna touch it again. She just got really curious and she was able to regress other people into another lifetime. And, um, and she was very diligent in documenting everything. And because this was new material for her, um, she was able to research the information that she would retrieve during the, these past life regressions, and she was able to match lived experience to the experiences that her clients would have. For instance, like um, if she were to regress somebody into Europe in the 1400s, she would find out about transportation, means of transportation, what it looked like, or dishes, and she could go and research these little trivial details and found out that what was coming forward during regressions was actual lived experience. Does that make sense? Like she would pull up details that, and people, you know, from different backgrounds, they didn't research into these areas. And this is something that comes forth in my own session and um, sessions and of my colleagues as well regularly, um, because 
when we're helping somebody explore a different lifetime, we ask kind of trivial questions about, well, what does it look like when you're having a meal? What kind of food are you eating? What kind of dishes are you using? Because that can really place somebody in a specific culture and a specific time. That's kind of the ways that you can tie it in with, with historical data. So she did this, wrote um, many books about it. Um, like the first one she wrote was Five Lives Remembered. And these were all sort of traditional past lives, meaning they fit within the, um, uh, the expansion of her mind at the time that it seemed like people accessed a life that had been lived in a time before the current lifetime. And I'm kind of explaining this because later on, I mean, she writes in the foreword of every book that through her work, her mind was being stretched over and over and over just just when she thought okay finally now i have the whole concept down this is how the universe works and then she would have a slew of clients that would bring in like other concepts that would kind of um poke holes in that um, mental construct that she had formed about the universe so the beginning was kind of you know neatly packaged past lives and then um in the 1980s and uh, 90s she was she got involved in um you know, aliens and abductions. She was always speaking at uh, MUFON uh, conferences. I don't know if you're familiar. More people? Oh. Are you joining in? Yeah, anyway. Yeah. All oh, right, thank you. Oh, so, um, where was I? So, UFOs, thank you, thank you. So, and this is when a lot of clients found her that had partial memories of being abducted, as we call it, or, you know, had been aboard spaceships. And at the time, there was no context for these experiences. So um, people had a lot of fear about it. And so she regressed these people into these experiences where they were taken aboard spaceships. And um, what she found out that, that all the people that she worked with for being visited by their star family, that these people um, were now in, in a human Earth body, but that they had come from a different galaxy, different planet, and um, with the purpose of helping to raise the frequency of human consciousness of planet Earth. And so all of you here tonight, and you at home as well, you're probably from other places as well. This is quite common. You know, tonight you might not dip into one of those lifetimes, but I found like it's it's super common, like we're all interdimensional beings. However, we don't always choose as a soul to bring these experiences into our current lifetime. You know, I have the amazing luck, I think, to meet a lot of interesting people that come to see me because they've had so many weird, odd experiences that cannot be placed in our normal reality, if you will. And um, so I get to hear about their current life experiences that are just so crazy. You know, people that see spaceships all the time or, I mean, it's, that's not the craziest thing. I'm just trying to see what the craziest is, but I can't think of it um, because it's, it's becoming quite common. But people with really interesting experiences of timeline switching or having memories of being aboard spaceships or, um, you know, have access to light language or this, to this knowledge of being in different places. So... I find it really interesting because I've always, as a kid, uh, been looking for kind of proof of the unseen worlds. And in my job right now, I get to kind of um, explore this on a day-to-day -day basis. But anyway, so Dolores Cannon, she uh, regressed people into these experiences and what she found out that these were benevolent creatures from a different realm and that the people that are here now, lots of them, um, came from this different place. So. I found out that I'm also part of that um, wave of volunteers that came to Earth. And all of you here tonight and at home, you're, you're part of this as well. I know this because you're here tonight. This is not an accounting class or how to become a claims adjuster. <laughs> you know, your interest is in this work here tonight. So um, how, when I kind of reverse engineer my life, you know, I always felt very, very different from the world around me, from the people around me when I first became aware back in the 1970s when I watched the news with my parents and I saw like, oh my God, what kind of fucked up place are we in? Like I saw the news and 
the kind of people that were running the show that had all the power and I could see that they were very, you know, traumatized, limited human beings that just functioned from fear. I mean, I didn't have these, this language at the time for myself, but I could just feel there was something amiss here. There was a lack of compassion and a lack of caring and this functioning was very low vibratory. And so if you have that kind of perception towards life, if you've had a difficult time fitting in, um, if you are very different, maybe in earthly ways, like I'm gay and genderqueer. I mean, there's so many standards and norms in this world that tell you that there's something wrong with you because every culture chooses its, you know, its aspects which are validated and which are not. You know, as a woman, you know that you're kind of validated less than being a man. And in the United States, it's better if you're white. And if you're straight and masculine, those are all like a little bit better than all the other aspects. And there's nothing wrong with any of these aspects, but what I'm trying to get at is that the way of thinking that you find on this planet is not acknowledging and celebrating and embracing of everybody's diversity. And we're not here with the kind of focus on everybody to really help them be their best self. Instead, we tell them, no, shut all that down and go be what you're supposed to be. Like my own parents, they were raised in the, in the 40s and 50s in Europe. They just did what they were told because that's where they gained their validation and being good enough. And that's where they fit in and they were appropriate. Things that we're still dealing with today and that you're probably also dealing with. I kind of got a tangent, I think. What was I talking about? <laughs> this happens all the time. Oh my God, I get so into it. Um, so aliens, yes, that you all are here from different places as well. So if you've had these experiences, my God, the breadcrumbs, I got them back. So if, <laughs> um, if you have this experience that you felt different or that you didn't belong, um, you came here to show how it's done, not to play small. And why I love doing this work is because it lends itself very well for people to explore these other aspects of their being beyond the aspects that have been validated by our culture and our society. Because you're magic, you know, all of you, me as well, everybody is the point the universe is trying to make. You are a unique, purposeful expression of source. You know, that sounds maybe kind of simple and trivial, but it's quite radical if you place it within the trauma-based and cruel systems of thinking that are present on this planet. You can see this all around yourself. I mean, there's so many systems here on the planet that are based on cruelty or that seem, you know, we think they're perfectly normal, but they have so much cruelty in them where solutions for problems are chosen that exploit other people, that exploit animals, that exploit the planet and nature. I mean, this is quite obvious, I think. Um, so if you came in here into this world with the sense of being different or kind of knowing that there is a um, more compassionate and loving way to be that includes everybody, animals, nature included, then um, I am like 99% sure that you've had lives on different planets and that you purposefully came to this planet to help raise the frequency of consciousness. So are you freaked out? Okay, <laughs> I didn't think so, but just checking. Um, so, yeah, so this Dolores Cannon, she wrote many, many books about this particular aspect as well, these, this kind of star family stuff. And this is one of the books that kind of got me interested in her work. When I picked up her book, you know, by accident, um, in 2006, it was the first time that I had seen something written that matched what I kind of know, what I kind of knew inside of myself, even though I didn't have the language or words for it. And it resonated so strongly. So I found out that she was teaching in the Netherlands. I was able to join her class. And I got to tell you, like I was always like a C student, was always the one that was always late for class, skipping class. I dropped out of high school, um, you know, got my bachelor's and my master's later on, but I was always still just barely doing enough just to get by because it was never truly interesting until I was in Dolores's class. You know, I'd never been more focused on you know knowledge like flowing out of this wonder wondrous lady i just absorbed it through my pores through my skin it was just i was completely like turned on by it and um you know it was an indicator for me that this is part of my life purpose which is why i feel so at home in the work that i do today and 
um, it gets me to help other people turn on to their own purpose, you know, and um, tonight you might get a hint of it. You know, this, this work is not just past life tourism, it's first and foremost a healing journey. What we're going to be doing tonight is we're going to let your higher self determine what are the most appropriate scenes for you to witness. And now when you're exploring them yourself, you might think like, why am I looking at this random life? This is not, I'm not a Palladium princess or an Atlantean priestess. I'm just like a very simple, you know, dressed in rags, little farm boy, you know, herding some sheep in the south of France in the 1400s. What does it have to do with me? So the scenes that you're going to be shown today are healing for you in one way or another. Um, in my private sessions, after I help people explore different lifetimes, the next part is that I talk to their higher self. They've then um, sufficiently sort of taken a different seat within their own consciousness where I can talk to their higher self and ask them about, why did you show them these random scenes? What is this all about? Tonight, we can't do that because this is a group format and I can't possibly talk to your higher selves individually because it will be a long drawn out process. People will get distracted. But um, after your process, I will help you to figure out, you know, why you went into those random scenes, how to tie it all together and make it make sense for yourself. Um, which one of you have done uh, regression before? No? Oh, this is great. I've got a bunch of regression virgins here. It's great. <laughs> I'll be gentle. So, <laughs> um, so um, it's called past life regression. Dolores Cannon actually changed the name of this technique to quantum healing hypnosis technique because as her own work progressed, she realized that people would not just go into past lives, but also they would start telling her about being an energy being or a creator being or some kind of alien and that there was no time from their perspective. And they would explain or the higher self would explain that from the perspective of the soul, there is no such thing as time. This is a construct that we use here in the 3D on planet Earth. It's very useful to us here because we came here to learn through contrast, to learn the happy through the sad, to learn who we are as God or source or creator, to do life as me, as you, as you, dealing with all these challenging circumstances. You know, this is the most, well, one of the most advanced schools of learning. So your soul is advanced to come to earth, to be able to manage the difficulties that you find within the system that has time and space and um, this duality kind of learning. We learn who we are here through the challenges. You know, nobody pops out of their mom's womb and says, okay, I am here, I am complete, let life happen. I guess I'm gonna go snack and watch Netflix for the rest of my life because there's not, nothing is gonna be happening. There's not gonna be any challenges no um no obstacles you know this is what we came here for so as a soul you know you scripted your life you chose your life you know and this might be very hard to accept and i'm not talking from your human you know your human um mindset but i'm talking from the soul your soul scripted your whole life including all the horrible circumstances that you might have dealt with this might be hard to understand but um, this is what you came here as a soul for, um, from my perspective. This is not to, you know, belittle our human experience, not at all. Especially, you know, during sessions, I always advocate for the human experience. But this is what I hear over and over. This is what my colleagues hear over and over, and Dolores Cannon as well. As a soul, which is very, it's a very different perspective than our human perspective, we chose our lives. Yeah. And, I mean, kind of when you think about it, like, Having gone through some hardship yourself, I'm sure you have as well, you know, when you look back at it, if you've gotten through it and were forced to deal with the, the trauma of it, you know, coming out of it at the other end, I've certainly done this for myself, it has sort of placed me in my own life's purpose more. You know, I found out things about myself through the hardship that I've experienced that cleared the path for me for me to do what I love to do. It taught me to really listen to myself. And that is, that is a thing that it's, doesn't come natural on this planet because we're, we're forced to, to turn our focus inside out, to leave our own fullness that we know when we are babies. This is maybe you've seen this in, in these little ones. They are expansive joy, pureness, wonder. 
Um, and that all collapses when we turn about four, five, six years old because our focus has left us. We have stopped trusting who we are and we've been traumatized into trying to fit into the standards and norms that our society provides for us as a means of feeling better about ourselves. So that what I'm finding out through this work, the pattern that shows up in all of our lives is that this is purposeful, that our soul opted into this to lose having access to your wonder, your nature, your magic for a while. And then through difficult experiences um, that, you know, you might call spiritual awakenings, um, that we get turned back on to, you know, who we really are. And for, you know, for many of us, including myself, my spiritual awakening, I mean, it's a fancy word, but it was some horrible experiences. You know, it's not rainbows and unicorns I'm talking about. This was some really difficult shit that I had to deal with for years before I could feel kind of normal again. Um, well, no, I shouldn't say normal because what I learned is I'm norm not normal at all. <laughs> and I stopped trying to be normal. But, um, so your soul purposefully does this for to learn what it's like to gain the wisdom to walk an earth life, to learn what it's like to do you um, as you, and to learn to find yourself or see yourself through the difficult experiences. So, you know, take it or leave it, toss it over your shoulder if it doesn't resonate. That's, this is what I see in my work. And this is what I want to bring to people because I think it is an empowering way to look at life. You know, that life always happens for you. And instead of to ask, well, like, why me? Why is this happening to me? To say, like, what does this mean about me? You know, what this work shows me is that our external experience is always a reflection of our inner reality. Or external experience um, is in direct vibration or resonance with our inner reality. So if horrible experiences happen, including my own life, these are reflections of not you being an asshole, but of you learning, having learned to be an asshole to aspects of self. When you learn to embrace them and love them, you know, beyond the constructs of society, these reminders of what you've been doing to yourself will no longer have to be there. You know, I learned to judge my gender from a very young age because I was always playing, like doing girl stuff. I didn't know how to play with the boys, so I thought, you know, I was the freak kid in the village. I was, something was wrong with me. Was I a girl in a boy's body? I didn't know. Nobody was there to support me because nobody had the awareness about, you know, to support somebody being themselves rather than to try to fit them in to society so they could survive. So I was called names throughout my life. And um, I was very uncomfortable being around like typical straight guys if, you know, if you kind of generalize that, when I would be with them, I would feel uncomfortable and make myself really small um, until I learned to embrace my, my own gender, who I am and the aspect of gender. When I did that, not only did I feel comfortable in any kinds of spaces with any kind of genders, um, but I was no longer called names or made to feel uncomfortable because I no longer had any triggers here um, because I stopped judging myself for that. And so instead, I met more people like myself, more of the magic that I'd gotten to know myself as showed up in my life, external experience being in direct, direct vibrational resonance with our inner reality. So what that means in simple terms is the more that you love yourself, all aspects of you, the more that you will, your life will look like you and feel like you, the more that your magic gets a chance to unfold. You enjoying this so far? Did you forget to subscribe? Make sure to do so. It takes two seconds. Just press that little button, the red one. You know the one. Just press it, little like. All right, enjoy the rest of this content. I mean, there's all kinds of different reasons for it. What I'm finding out that there is no rule for anything, um, <clears throat> but it's not like your life sticking it to you or like being mean to you. It's oftentimes that we have missed the our higher self or our, our inner self talking to us because we were so focused on fitting in and doing what's right. And we've been so traumatized in not doing that, that we have just missed the voices that were soft whispers in the beginning. And at some point, you know, life is gonna make it very clear. It doesn't mean that you're stupid if you have cancer or some other horrible disease or some stuff happens. It's just like your life is just gonna trying to get your attention. Um, 
And so, and for some of us, you know, there, that's just the exit point. That can also just be it. You know, there is, we're all going to die. And for some of us, we've opted to check out through diseases or through accidents or just dying in our sleeps. There's all kinds of different options. Your soul has determined that from the beginning. And, you know, the whole journey, including, you know, a, a disease like that, if people deal with that, it is, it keeps being a learning process for the soul. So it's less about being goal oriented in the physical plane, getting the car, the house, the relationship, the cute body, the Instagram likes, all that stuff. You know, it's really the more that you learn to look at your life from the soul's perspective, um, more compassion happens for your earthly experience and you stop judging the fuck out of yourself, which is what we all learn to do. Yeah. But having said that, you know, there's all kinds of reasons. Like I just remember a recent session where somebody had a thyroid issue and, you know, I was listening to, to the higher self talking to me or they were bringing it up. And I was like, oh, here we go. That must be about speaking your truth because that often happens. And then stuff is cleared, the chakra is released and or chakra is cleared and then they're able to speak the truth. But this time it said, no, there's nothing spiritual or emotional happening. This is the, um, the condition he's been using for 20 years. It's toxic and he needs to stop using it. That influenced his thyroid. And then... Um, and then when he came out of his, his session, he said, oh my God, this is true. Do you see the, the bleach spots on my skull and on my hands? This is why I used to apply it. So it was just using toxins to, you know, it shut his thyroid down. So there's not always spiritual causes to physical issues. And, um, and sometimes we do create it ourselves. I remember a recent session where a lady had had endometriosis and fibroids and, um, and so I asked her higher self, what is going on here? And it said, well, she did not want to have ch children. She knew that she was going to do a life without children. That was not part of her life plan. So she created this to block her from having children. She was starting menopause by the time she came to see me. And so the higher self said, well, there's no more need for it because she's not going to have any babies now. So we can release it. And in her mind's eye, she saw this like blue laser light kind of zap it away. This is what it can do. This is what happens when, you know, we get a whiff of um, how powerful we are, you know. And when I say that, I'm not saying it from a perspective where you're supposed to be that powerful and what the hell have you been doing? You know, this is the journey of learning what it's like to become more and more powerful step by step by step by learning to love yourself instead of judging yourself. Why am I not powerful? Why don't I know how to do telepathy or you know, do telekinesis right now? What's wrong with me? I'm supposed to be God, all that stuff. No, you're here to do you as God. You're like God playing dress up, figuring out what life is like as you, as you, as you, as me. And with, with all the different aspects that you, that, and the challenges that you encounter. Wow, so I've gotten a little bit into the, uh, the background of this work, but um, let's see what time it is. Yeah. Um, so I was talking about that is not just fast life regression, but um, more like quantum healing. This is what Dolores kind of uh, um, changed the name into because she figured out there was way more going on than just going into a past life. And you tonight, you might experience this as well. You might be in a life that doesn't make any sense time-wise. Um, it might even be a parallel life that happens as well. Sometimes people go into a, a different lifetime where they describe TVs and computers. And it's a life that a part of their soul is living on a different part of the country or the planet. And um, the soul just decided, I'm going to split off into two lives that are happening at once on the planet. And these two parts never meet. This is what we call like a, a soulmate. You know, soulmate doesn't mean you're going to, you know, kiss each other and there's a sunset and you're going to be happily ever after. You know, soulmate is just a part of your soul that has a different, different path of learning just because your soul decided it's very efficient to have certain parameters in place in our current environment and for learning. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if any of that stuff happens for you tonight, do not be alarmed. You're not doing it wrong. Just trust it. Trust your process. However weird it is, I know that your higher self will bring you experiences that are uh, healing for you. 
even if it doesn't make any sense. So that brings me to some, some fun experiences that I experienced um, doing this work. When I first started doing this, I'm from the Netherlands. Um, it's a very rational and cerebral culture. It's one of the least religious nations on the planet, which has its advantages, but also we don't believe a whole bunch of stuff unless we can feel it and see it and touch it. So when I first started doing this work, I'd be sitting next to somebody who would tell me about their body being blue and they had three toes and they had a big head with big like wraparound bug eyes and they lived on planet Czar or whatever. Um, and I would be thinking like, are they making it up? Is this really real? And so time after time, I have had people go into experiences that could be fact-checked. They were historical lives. Um, the most recent that, that I experienced was a woman who, um, from England, she came in and um, she, one of her questions was about her current biological dad. She didn't meet him until she was 19 years of age. And so she wanted to know if they had shared any different lifetimes together. So we did the whole past life regression. I talked to her higher self. I go through the questions that she, that she brought in and I ask, her this, I ask her higher self this question. And it said, it just blurts out and says, yes, she was Michelangelo, the artist, that he was gay, had many, many different lovers, but that her now, her current biological, her current life biological dad was his then long-term assistant. And this client was in a state of trance. She, she just trusted her process to the point where she could hear a name. She told me, I can hear a name for this person. And I'm like, well, what is it? She goes, I can't say it. It's Italian, it's a different language. So we let her spell it out, letter for letter. And she spelled me a name that sounded like, um, uh, what was it spelled like? P-R-I-E-T-R, -E Prieter. Didn't sound Italian to me, but I just wrote it down. And we wrap up the session, she goes home. I take it to Google and um, this little paragraph pops up that said that Michelangelo um, did have a, didn't talk about him being gay and just, you know, being a bit of a slut. <laughs> and, but um, it did say that he did have an assistant for 25 years whose name was Pietro Urbino. You know, she almost nailed it. It was too close for comfort. It was just like two letters had been switched around. Um, and there's many more examples, but there's one really big one that um, I like to talk about. It was made into a book. It's the, bo the book, uh, The Boy Who Knew Too Much. It is the journey of a woman from a Christian background who had, has a son, a little Christian here. And um, he started telling her at age two that he used to be a tall German baseball player. She had no concept for uh, reincarnation because she was from a Christian background. And um, so it, she initially thought that this was just his kid's imagination. He was just saying some funny kid stuff. But she would have experiences with him that would denote that there was more going on. One time she took him to the Dodger Stadium and there was a big poster of Babe Ruth on the wall. Do you know who that is? Well, wow, okay. No, you don't. I'm the kind of gay, I don't do sports, so I thought it was a candy bar. But it's a legendary American baseball star, right? Yeah. So anyway, there was this big poster on the wall and little Christian had a complete meltdown. He said, that guy is really bad. We had a big fight. He's a bad guy. We had a big fight to the point where his mom needed to like drag him out of the area because he was having, having a total meltdown. So there were more of these experiences. And so um, instead of um, following the advice of a pastor who said that he needed an exorcism, <laughs> she said, well, hold on a moment, let me go for a second opinion. So she finally made it into my office um, and she told me this wonderful story. And I told her what I will tell you tonight as well, that I don't know what you're going to be shown because I leave it up to your higher self to show you what's the most appropriate and most healing for you tonight. We did go into the life of Christina Garrick, Lou Garrick's mom. You know, I took her through the induction. She starts describing a scene, a little living room. She describes her body. And it opens up into a working class environment on the East Coast in the 1930s and 40s. And we have her sitting at the dinner table. She knows the German nicknames for her family members. And then we explore this life of Christina Garrick, Lou Garrick's mom. And uh, you know who Lou Garrick is, right? Yeah. So um, it was very, very detailed. She had a lot of access to very detailed experiences, the little tchotchkes that she was given, awards that her son Lou had won. She described it in detail. And, um, and I always ask very like 
random trivial questions kind of to see if they're not making it up, you know, because if I ask them about stuff that they cannot have researched before, you know, it's kind of like I'm being a little bit suspicious or cautious, maybe rather. Um, like she said that she was walking towards the Yankee Stadium, that she was walking over the, the parking area that was grass, and she described her like her fancy dress. And this is the first time that she was going to watch her son Luke play. And um, so I moved her forward to being in the stadium and I had to look around like, what does it look like? And well, how is the score capped? You know, because I know I figured it wouldn't be digitally because there was no electricity or it was done digital differently. And she described how the, the numbers were being moved over manually. And um, so I asked her about what do you guys, are you going to have any snacks while you're watching the game? And she said, yes, we're having um, warm nuts. And I go, well, is it like roasted peanuts? And she goes, no, I think it's chestnuts. And she had never seen them in her current lifetime, lady from California. And, um, and then I said, I asked her, well, what are you drinking? Are you drinking anything? And she goes, yes, we're having a cola. You know, what American born person calls a Coca Cola? Um, so it's very interesting. So these little details I was just trying to get at to really anchor her in that experience, but also to, kind of check if it was lived experience and to tie it in with, you know, real lived historical data um, to because I can fact check it afterwards. Anyway, long story, she comes in two more times, she goes back into the same lifetime. This is remarkable has never happened to me since. And even tonight, you might find that you leapfrog through different lifetimes that you don't stay in just one. So at one at some point i ask her higher self why are we doing this why do we have to go back to the same lifetime over and over and over again so it said that she was to kind of mine that lifetime for little random details that she could go and fact check with the still living descendants and relatives of the garrick family and then write a book about it so she did all this she went to the east coast found these people and said like hey i'm this crazy lady from california that has done past life regression I've got some data here. Can you check it? I don't know how, what, if she said that, but um, she was able to fact check that whatever she came up with in her session was true. That she she just, I mean, when you read a book, she just basically explains, I was laying on a table. I knew who I was, that I was Kathy, but the stuff just drops into my mind's eye. I felt like I was just pulling it out of my ass. And then it ends up matching lived experience. And um, she entered the Hay House writing contest and the book won. So it's being, it was published and it's on its way to be made into a movie. So these experiences really showed me that whatever random, weird stuff people are experiencing, it is actual lived experience, if not from this planet, somewhere else or a different realm. Sometimes people see like energy blobs or colors. There are so many, there's a myriad of life forms and ways of living out there that does not match within the um, logical confines of our human mind you know and it's sometimes really hard when people go through those experiences to figure out what to ask about or oh, you're a blob great you know what's life like tell me about it <laughs> you know not a lot of data to get from that because it's so different um you know i'm saying this as well for you tonight if you're going to experience that doesn't make any sense there's no reason to invalidate your experience just trust whatever your experience is right for you all right um any questions so far Right. nothing here neither so this process tonight works with hypnosis now usually when i use the word hypnosis immediately it conjures up images of movies where the hypnotist like dangles the shiny object or has the magic snap of their fingers and people just like go out completely like it's anesthesia and you're not going to remember that is not what hypnosis is you know it's way easier You've all experienced hypnosis many, many, many times because it's one of the natural cycles that our consciousness cycles through on any given day. It's this, the, this the, kind of the stage that you move through as you're waking up or going to sleep or when you're driving places, forgetting how you got there, or even when you're sitting here listening and you're kind of making up images, you know, f um, as a result of the words that I'm speaking to you. Hypnosis is simply the ability to have focused awareness in one place and to kind of tune out other things. It doesn't mean that you're not going to hear the crickets or the traffic. It just means that you're, you're being proactive in wanting to focus in your mind's eye tonight. That's where the story happens. So if you say, oh, I'm just hearing a car. Okay, now I fucked it up. You know, what am I going to do now? 
No, it's just like meditation. You know, when you get distracted, bring yourself back to what you were exploring. You can do this. You have dominion in your own inner experience. You don't have to be all passive about it. You can just go back to what you were exploring. So do that for yourself because I cannot do it with you because we're in a group here. All right. Um, so um, because this is first and foremost a healing experience, we're going to be doing a bit of centering and setting our intentions. If you're dealing with any challenges in your life currently, I invite you to weave them into your um, intention settings. I'm going to, are you okay? Yeah, just exhale. Okay. <laughs> it brought something up. <laughs> um, so we're going to be doing some intention setting. I'm going to take you through that process um, and then we'll get into some past lives. You know, picture yourself in a challenging experience that you're in right now and then see yourself in what it would feel like to have that resolved or and go for the feeling of it. Don't, you know, skip the how to's or I want to release this and that. Just go like, I want to be joyful with my partner. I want to be joyful in my work. I want to be in a place where I I'm expansive and joyful and purposeful or something. Yeah. yeah you don't have to like micromanage your experience. And that goes also for your regressive experience. Just, you don't have to work at this. You know, your higher self is who you are at your core. It's not some random part that's up on a cloud that's going to swoop in tonight and like, you know, give you the riot act or like tell you about, you know, or like the burning bush showing up and tell you like, you should, you know, no. It is just your inner knowing that is always there. And this process just helps you to kind of set aside your normal conscious thinking you might find it still present, even commenting on like, this is really fucked up or this is weird. What is this about? You know, but that's not the part that we're going to be engaging with. We're going to just be trying to go back to the to the story that you're that you're exploring for yourself. So it's kind of like meditation. If you get distracted, at least this happens to me when I meditate. Bless you. Um, when I start making my grocery list or thinking about what I'm going to watch on YouTube, then I know, OK, wait, I just became my thoughts. I'm supposed to be watching them. I just pull myself back to what I was doing instead of like beating myself up over like, oh my God, my meditation is fucked. I did it all wrong. It's, you know, no more use to it. So just be kind to yourself. Yeah. Um, oh, another thing that people sometimes ask if they're worried, worried about is that this process is somehow um, forceful or not respecting of your human experience right now that we're going to rip the lid of like a whole space of unsavory information that's going to like fly up in your face and you're going to feel horrible forever afterwards that you're going to have to deal with that is not what's going to happen you know your higher self is the part of you that knows that knows it is god's or its creator but when i use the word god i'm sorry sometimes it's triggering for people i don't mean like the white bearded christian asshole i mean god's source creator like the old that is yeah <laughs> so um that's who you are. So that's the part that is going to give you those random experiences. It is pure love and it's very, very wise. It's a different kind of wisdom that you, your conscious mind has. So try to just be open to it, just to see what it has in store for you and trust your process. All right. Here we go. I hope you're ready. So everybody at home, um, uh, the best way to do this for you is to have some headphones or earbuds. So you have my voice like beaming in the middle of your head instead of, you know, hearing your partner like turn on the the, um, the Nutribullet, you know, making a smoothie or make coffee or something. So head, headphones is helpful and to um, slouch, but to not, I mean, to just like, get some support, but to not lay down because you might fall asleep, you two there. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Do whatever feels right, but no, there is a risk. Yeah, yeah, there is. A, oh, you came in later. I was telling everybody like, I'm very good at talking people to sleep. So you might end up having like a $20 nap or 15, I forgot what you pay here. Yeah, so it's best to sit up a little bit to have some support so you can relax and not strain, um, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being a part of this class. We hope to see you at the next one.